the Boxing Now podcast. I am your host, that dude named Dave, and to my left, but he's my right-hand man, Jorge. How is it going today? Doing great, Dave, man. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here, man. Hey, let's get this started here. As always, click on like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so when new episodes come, you get them right away. And if you can't be on YouTube, check us out on Spotify. Click the follow button. And if you're not on those two destinations, if you're on the Zingo app channel 250, holler at us at Spanglish Sports World. That's where we're at, man. So for this episode here of Boxing Now Podcast, what we're doing, we're talking boxing, Jorge. Talking boxing. Talking uh, nice. talking Caleb. Caleb's. The Caleb's, yes. Yeah. So the last episode, we did a fight preview between Caleb Plant and Caleb Truax. Now, I spelled that name bad last week. But thanks to Max Kellerman, I got it right right now. Yeah, uh, usually with the next and the last name, those tend to be uh, silent for the most part. So, yeah, I actually had to watch, uh, well, after watching the fight and then uh, Max Kellerman and then watching a prior fight, uh, yeah, it is Truex, it's pronounced. So. Truex. So for anybody watching, listening, I know I'm bad at some of these names here, but I'm trying. I am trying. Uh, it's a skill I, that he's working on. Yeah, hooked on phonics work for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm showing my age every episode by throwing out these one-liner commercials and stuff like that. But let's get back to the the, uh, the thing at hand here, which is boxing, which is Caleb Plant, who had a big, big victory on Saturday night against Caleb Chuax, and he retained his IBF super middleweight title. What did you think about the fight, Ori? Uh The fight was uh, about... What I was expecting, just based on what I saw Plant's previous fight was, uh, Truex did the best he could, but, uh, you know, when he won this fight against James DeGale, he was, you know, I think, 34 at the time, and he had a, a better game plan for a fighter uh, that just came up from an 11th month layoff. I think uh, Plant was kind of prepared for Truax's uh, boxing IQ, and uh, he definitely stayed within himself. He didn't deviate from the plan that he typically comes up with, where he tries to... Uh, basically wear you down uh, round by round, and, and essentially if he tries to finish you off, he'll finish you off in the later rounds, but uh, he's definitely of the hit and don't get hit mold, um, which if you're familiar with, uh, that would be like the Floyd Mayweather types or Arizlandi Lara's. Um, any body, fighter with a long reach and fast hands um, tend to, you know, they tend to fight that way. And uh, Plant's good. Plant's interesting. He's got yeah. some, uh, he fights at different angles, throws punches at different angles, stuff that I mentioned about him in our, in our preview for the fight. But post-fight, uh, wasn't any different. Came with the same conclusions. Um, it appeared that he had hurt his hand in, and, and I had to watch the fight twice to kind of see where it looked like he kind of hurt it. And it looked like around the uh, tail end of the fourth round where Tru- Truex was putting a little bit more pressure in that last minute. And then going into the fifth round, it looks like it looked like Plant took a round off there. It was like the only time where Truex actually looked like he was punch for punch with him but after that it, it was really uh plant one every round after that i, I mean i mean literally I, it was like an 11 one fight i usually could have still saw it 12 zero for me it's on the same line when we talked about we were joking around about uh Kenil alvarez had that shutout fight against uh caleb S- caleb smith mm-hmm. i scored it 121 away there was not a round that i felt that truax did anything to win a round i'm um, I thought he was a dangerous fighter. You know, he was a former title holder. He's been at 168 for a long time, a little bit longer than the tooth now. And this fight showcased that he is no longer a title challenger, but journeyman status. And I hate that people think when you hear journeyman, it's a bad word, but it's not, you know, sometimes, you no, know, not sometimes it happens in sports. Uh, athletes get old, you know, you're no longer be a top of the heap. And so he is still a world-class fighter. Just the fact that the days of him, fighting for a world championship i think are done now and he's the type of fighter that if you have a young up-and-coming fighter you want to gauge that fire see if he's ready for a caleb plant or if you think he's the next step is a canelo alvarez or you know um as far as billy joe saunders in the division you would put him against caleb truex now that's mm-hmm. that's where he's at i mean a good fighter you know but his time is, is behind him now yeah and a, and a great example for Truex, you know, in a fight, you know, I'm, I, you know, I talked about him all the time. Edgar Rolanga. I mean, if that's, if that's a, I mean, that's, that's, he's, that's a realistically a fight that could happen just because of what Truex is basically. He's, he's just a journeyman status now, no longer, I mean, long past gatekeeper status, but now true journeyman status. And he's basically someone you want to put up against uh, that doesn't mind taking the paycheck and, and doesn't mind taking the risk against uh, dangerous fighters coming up. So I, I mean, I could I could see Berlanga and him getting into a fight. I I also wouldn't be surprised if Truax might be just hanging it up after after all this and stuff. I mean, this is his last title fight. He's probably gonna go after. He's thirty seven. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I can I, I, I can see he's pretty much done. I mean, if if you might see him again, you might even see him at super middle. We might see him at light heavyweight going, you know, being a journeyman up there at light heavyweight, where the there's probably maybe uh, more up and coming fighters that are still trying to make their their way up and maybe aren't as dangerous as Berlanga, right? Because sure. Berlanga could, uh, you know, you, last thing you want to do with Truex at 37, 38 is getting a paycheck and uh, getting your lights like, I knocked could, out. I could see Truex probably fighting like a David Benavides, you know. Um, they talk about David possibly fighting a Caleb Plant, but that's not happening no time soon because Al Hammond has a game plan. They're yeah. both at 168, go to 175 one day. Canelo's the prize. If you got two guys that are undefeated, and you know that the top man is right there, and you've been negotiating for Canelo to come up to PBC because that was one of the things with Canelo before he did his uh, his couple of fight deals that we've been talking on previous episodes mm-hmm. is that he talked to Al Heyman, he talked to Eddie Hearn, but for his for what his schedule that he wants to do right now in his career, it makes sense to be on the zone and to fight these guys, and then eventually go to the PBC and fight those guys. Sure. So, uh, like I said for Truax, I see him being a, a journeyman. And fighting the guys like that, basically, who are not the title holders right now, stepping up so that they can get ready to fight a Canelo Alvarez. Like you said there, you know, your Edgar uh, Berlanga, you know, um, David Benavides. And there's a few other guys that PBC does have right now. Um, so I wouldn't take for him like, yeah, he, he got beat. Guys have their nights where they know it. It's, it's a wrap. But he he set himself up where that Al Hamm is going to use him several more fights down the line he's well, not i don't i can see where you're saying that he could retire i look at him like al Heyman probably would put him in in several fights that helps the other guy but also help his pocketbooks because that's what al Heyman is known for yeah no and, and, and honestly that would make sense for any promotional team to have somebody like truex under their belt that is basically you know he might look for something in his contract something more upfront money where he's basically you know he's being taken care of and he's not mm-hmm. worried about getting into a ring with a dangerous fighter up and coming fighter with some true knockout power and, and feel like you're being a, a, addressed ahead of time before the fight even starts and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and, and to your point, it makes sense to have that guy in your stable because there's going to be up and coming fighters that need to get tested on the way up. And there's nothing wrong with putting him against a veteran that's going to basically expose certain things, especially a veteran like him with good boxing IQ that could expose certain weaknesses, holes in the defense that, you know, they, you know, they'll fight, you know, the up and coming fighter might still win the fight, but it's something that he can learn off of, especially, you know, especially if he really is taking his career seriously, take that, you know, take that fight and get, uh, get the experience needed to make some adjustments. Yeah. And on top of that too, I'm talking a lot about Tris because we don't, t- there's guys that you really don't talk about nowadays. You know, um, he's a guy that no show is really going to talk about. I, also too, I could see him as someone, like I said, a journeyman or maybe a stepping stone or in between fight. He's at 168. Who's to say that he did like a catch weight Against a Charlo, Jamal yeah. Charlo. You know, like, let's say Tr- um, Charlo doesn't have a dance partner. He's looking to fight. He wants to be consistent. Can you have him come down to 160 or do a non title fight like a middle, like 164, like, uh, you know, catch weight to see if he's ready to go to 168? Yeah. You know, so guys like him do have a factor in boxing, you know, you know, so I look at that, like, especially 160, 160, and maybe 175. Who knows? You might want to put him in with somebody and you do a catch weight at 170, 172. I'm just stating these things because, you know, guys like that, we are, we see them hang on a little bit longer than normal. Like, for instance, like on Friday night, uh, Bermain Stavern fought. Mm-hmm. It's crazy he's still fighting. Yeah. His last big meaningful fight when he lost twice to Deontay Wilder like six, seven years ago. Yeah. You know, and he's still hanging on. So I'm saying that, like, true asking to be able to hang on, and Hamish is going to give him the fights. Yeah. I can see that. So with that in mind, uh, what you was breaking down the fight, um, you talk about how Plant hurt his hand. Yeah. Even with his hand hurt, he boxed really, really well. Oh, yeah. Masterfully. I mean, one thing that we noticed is that he stood in the pocket, kept his distance, and he popped the jet. It wasn't just, you know, a one-hitter quitter. He wasn't just trying to, you know, just quick hitter quitter. He literally was pumping it, range finding it. He was using his distance, his footwork to circle the ring, mm-hmm. but he stayed in the pocket. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he really showed good boxing skills. And the one thing that I noticed we was talking earlier is the fact that even though uh, Truex did not land many shots, the shots that were flush, Plant took them, ate them like Skittles, reset, and just came back and reestablished his jab. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and 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 the better part about that is that when he took those punches, I mean, those were like in the later halves of the fight. Truex is typically known as being a slow starter, self-described slow starter because he'll mm-hmm. lit it himself and stuff. But by the seventh, eighth round, I mean, you know, there were a couple shots that Plant took and stuff. But again. When you only get hit with them once or twice and stuff, and you've been doing most of the hitting, I mean, by that point, he's already, I think, I mean, when I, when we talk about Caleb Plant being, you know, a hit and no hit guy, mm-hmm. that is, that is, 
by the ninth round, he had already had like a four to one, five to one uh, punch landed advantage. He had already had landed way so many jabs and different types of punches from different angles mm -hmm. that by the time Truex is able to land something of, of value, um, it's usually one punch and it's not doing nearly as much damage as you would if he had gotten to him earlier. Right. So, I mean, yeah. to me, I mean, so, so, I mean, if you had flipped the script on punches landed, that punch that Truex would land should be knocking him down. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the case because it wasn't, he wasn't getting to him pretty much none of that fight. It, 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 was, it was, I think, I think Plant took round five off and that was probably, you know, still Plant's round overall. But you can tell from this, the, the punch stat numbers that it wasn't, uh, he wasn't the same. Right. He was, I think, he was still trying to shake off the, uh, the, the hand pain yeah. and trying to just get through a round where he needed to figure out where he was at with the pain mm -hmm. and if he can tolerate it. And he was able to tolerate it the rest of the way and still use that hand. Yeah. So the question is going to be now he got, we talked about this fight last episode and the key for him, because he was expected to win, to win, look good and get out healthy. Yeah. He did two of the three. <laughs> yeah. And, and then with boxing, it's usually, I mean, if you're, if your goal is in every fight to accomplish those three things, right. Uh, you, you know, more often than not, it's hard to get all three. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to come out there with some wear and tear. What you don't want is something that keeps you out of a, a training camp or out of the sparring ring for a lengthy period of time. Right. So, so with this hand fracture and, and, and if anybody's been in a bare knuckle fight, who's ever punched somebody and stuff, um you're not if you're getting a fracture usually it's not going to be on your knuckles it's going to be somewhere on your metacarpals mm -hmm. i mean one of the smaller uh fried bones basically but on the on the base of your hand and stuff so chances are he got it there and i mean i remember when i had my injury that was three months no, three weeks in a cast and then probably three to six months where that hand took a while to recover uh, or at least i felt comfortable doing natural stuff with it again mm -hmm. uh, imagine him being on the same timeline you hope at this point, he's on the timeline to still probably recover and start training camp to get ready for Canelo in September. I would hope, you know, and that's you know, and that's assuming Canelo wins his fight against Billy Joe Saunders, which we'll also get to that in a few minutes. But you know, if if the the goal is to fight Canelo, I from a boxing point of view, from my point of view, I hope he's not fighting him in September. I hope he fights him in December, where he's got a little bit more time. I want Plant at his hundred percent best. Because I actually believe Plant could give Canelo some trouble. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, any fighter, the fighters that gave Canelo trouble were Mayweather and, and Lara in the hit and don't get hit mold. Mm -hmm. Except Plant's willing to engage. He's willing to hit you. He will throw, he will double, he will triple that jab. He will throw the jab at different angles. And he, I think, can give Alvarez some problems. I think he'll make the fight interesting. I don't know if he'll win. Mm -hmm. he'll, get, he'll make the fight interesting and make it problem a problem for Alvarez to actually maybe land combinations, right? I can see Alvarez even getting stuck in a pot shot mode. They were having to throw one punch at a time because that's, that's how good plans defense is. So uh, I'm hoping he's a hundred percent for that fight and doesn't, if he's a hundred percent for September, that's fine. I, I feel better about a December fight. Let, 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 let me uh, pick it back off that for you now. Sure. So I think that timing's on his side. Now it actually works out that he fought first. Yeah. Like we, we, other episodes we broke down the timeline of what Canelo's doing in the super middleweight division for his future fights. So the fact that he fought on Saturday night and we're film we're recording this episode in the first week of February. So it's been confirmed Canelo we talked about already. He's fighting February 27th mm -hmm. for his mandatory. It also got confirmed. We talked about it but it's official now. Cinco de Mayo uh weekend, he, Billy Joe Saunders. So that's in play. So then of course his schedule for uh Mexican Independence weekend in September so by him fighting first now, the last week of January, he has all of February, March, April, going to hopefully see Canelo win in May, then June. He don't need to start sparring until July. So depending how bad the, the what are, hope is no major broken bones, hopefully it's just a strain that it takes time and healing, no surgery. If that's the case, he can still stay, stay working out because his hands stay physically fit, keep his endurance going, and he don't got to hit a punching bag to what july maybe um most sessions are like eight weeks for a good training session people don't want to go to more than 10 weeks man like mid-july it's february now so he if it's not a bad injury time's on the side but i agree with you if it's if it requires surgery and we know that canelo wants to be the undisputed champion as well as him because if canelo wins he will have the three belts and he will have the ibf belt canelo's timelines you know said may september possibly a december fight so maybe he gives Triple G a shot in September if he's not healthy. 
and then he comes back around and comes back at Caleb Plant in December. Who knows? But I like the fact that he's first. He fought all 12 rounds, even though he I felt he should have knocked out Truax, but we know why, because the hand was hurt. But the fact that he fought all 12 rounds and looked good, even though he didn't get the knockout, it makes me hopeful that he will be healthy for September. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. But if he's not, I agree with you. I mean, even though it's your biggest payday and this is your biggest fight, you want to be as healthy as possible because Canelo ain't giving you a rematch unless you did something to warrant that rematch. I got Triple G, controversy, mm -hmm. a, a freaking draw. That's the reason why we had a rematch in the third fight. If Canelo had won that first fight, I don't think we'd be down Triple G two or three right now, maybe two. Yeah. You know, Canelo's one of those type of fighters like a Floyd. Like Manny and stuff, if you fight Mar Emmanuel Marquez, you only gonna get one shot at him. Maybe if you're Tim Bradley. You mean Maidana? Maidana's what we we're talking about. We fought him twice. Who? Cool. Talk about him. Well, Mayweather. Oh, May yeah, Mayweather fought yeah, Maidana yeah, twice. Yeah, that's but, the only guy he's fought twice. Yeah, and, and that was timing because he there was no one in the wealth weight division people were willing to pay uh seventy four dollars for a pay per view at that time in twenty thirteen because we look at the landscape, no one didn't even want him to fight Amir Khan. Yeah, you know? no, but, but it was funny with Madonna. Madonna was like, you came away from that first fight like the people's champ on yes, that fight. Yes, he did, yeah. He had that people's champ vibe, and, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. and the people wanted to see him fight a second time. It, it was, uh, what, what do you say, uh, a moral victory? Pyrrhic victory. Yeah, yeah, that's what he had. So it's very little that you see a top guy give a rematch unless it's warranted. Maybe it was the case. He couldn't find anyone to spend seventy four nine nine for a pay per view, and the masses cried. We want to see it back again, and he shut him out. Manny, and controversial loss to Tim Bradley, or the reason why it was a rematch. Yep. Marquez, they're just they're just so evenly keeled that you know you you know some fighters have those battles, but at the end of the day, the top guys don't go after second time, third time around. Yeah. guys. No, you on to the next next because you, you go to round thirteen, that other fighter knows more about you. Even though you're the great fighter and you can make adjustments and beat him better the second time. There's that chance too. The other fighter knows you more too as well. Yep. So it's like finish business on to the next. Yep. So like you said, a plan. I hope he's healthy because I doubt he gets a second chance unless he unless something crazy happens. We have fan man coming down from the ceiling, you know, some crazy <laughs> stuff like that. But who knows? We'll see if he's healthy or not, and we'll monitor that in the next few months. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, just not just that. It's just I, 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 at the end of the day, there's certain fights that you kind of believe they have a chance to do something great, and mm -hmm. plans. I think. He's, he's got that potential. I think he can do something great against Canelo. I think he gives him one of those difficult fights. Again, I mean, Canelo hasn't had too many difficult fights, but the fights where it's hit and don't be hit, I mean, it's, it's the, the only two that I can think of where, I mean, Mayweather, he was shut out, and I think and against that, uh, Lara, uh, Lara, it was uh, close enough. But uh, I was advocate on that, though. Those fights were 2013 and 2014 mm -hmm. with Lara, so we're talking eight and seven years. Yeah. He has fought his fair share of really true boxers now. The master class was Mayweather, best boxer of our time. Yeah. Classic boxer, when I say that. People may say, you know, you like, I'm saying, in the ring who he's fought. Yeah. And like I said, Laura Southpaw, classic boxer, you know, gives clinic lessons. Canelo's given those classic boxing lessons too. So yeah. for the time that we saw Canelo at his lease, we can't say that eight years later, he ain't took those tools, those gems, what Mayweather gave him, Laura gave him, uh, Austin Trout gave him, another good boxer yes. in South Paul, all these lessons, and he's incorporated that to the only person that's in any, any kind of controversy was Triple G. Yeah. So you make a good point. I'm thinking that when this happens, we're going to see more display of his boxing skills. And one thing I want to add, too, that I feel that Caleb Plant is going to be in a world of hurt because I don't know if Caleb Smith was the perfect dance partner for El Canelo. I think that fight showed the best of Canelo Alvarez. He didn't knock him out. Because he's a big guy, you know. But I'm looking at the total package. I'm looking at his footwork. He was healthy. His jab, his power, his combinations, everything wrapped in one. Canelo, without all the major wars, not being beat up, he's in his prime right now. And he's look, he looks good. So for Plant, he has to be healthy because he cannot sit in that pocket and try to pump that jab with Canelo sitting right there. If Canelo could sit in the pocket with Triple G and eat his jabs, Plant will be done by under eight, nine rounds. And looking at that fight, Plant is fighting from the outside more than I, I think he'll have to go in at times, but not go in. I think with Truex, Truex came at him with the Truex came at him with the same plane plan he came with against the Gale. He just kept coming. Mm -hmm. And and in this case, there were the jabs that Plant landed on him, you know, held them at bay. Uh, when we're talking about Caleb Smith and Canelo, I, I mean, we basically, we, we, I mean, we, we talked about the fight, uh, post fight ad nauseum. When you give it up before the fight even starts, 
and you're not willing to engage, you you get the result of what happens there. Mm -hmm. I think Caleb Plan is not standing there to just take the hits and mm -hmm. not engage back. So right. I think he's going to he's he's when you're fight when you are a hit and don't get hit fighter. Um, there's a reason why by the ninth, tenth round, you've already got about a five to one advantage of punches you've already landed because you've done you've done your work, right? You're willing to double your jab, triple your jab at spots where your the, the opponent's not expecting it. You're willing to throw the jab at a certain angle where the fighter's not expecting it, and throw your power punches where not expecting it. So he's, mm -hmm. to me, he came away. Uh, I'm impressed with his conditioning. He's he's fighting. He's he fights all twelve. He's training for all twelve rounds. That's just yeah. legitimate. He, he he's not trying to knock you out in the first six rounds. He's basically trying to soften you up and see if there's a possibility later on if something opens up where okay, I'm trying to knock you out. Right. So with that said, I mean he's he's definitely going to be. I think in it. I mean I don't think he's going to be in a world of hurt against Canelo. I just think if he's not, <laughs> if he takes this fight earlier than he's supposed to. And fights Canelo at ninety percent, then he's in a world of hurt. He needs he needs to be hundred percent in order to to be able to at least make it a competitive fight. Yeah, so he has about eight months before fight time. It's you know I said we're recording this on the first week of February. Uh, Mexican Independence Weekend is normally the second weekend of September, yep. ninth month, the second month. So like I said, if he doesn't need surgery, all he needs is rest. He can stay physically fit on form. Don't start sparring until maybe end of June, July. He should be okay. If he's not, he needs surgery. Hey, you know what? I know what Canelo laid out for you. Just hold on. You already got your mandatory. The one thing he talked about in the pre-fight, um, he he did two back-to-back -back mandatories mm -hmm. so that he has a whole year and don't have to worry about the IBF right now. So that was smart on him. He has time in his hand, and he got rid of the mandatory crap, the crap that Canelo's doing right now in February, yep. the politics. So worst-case scenario, if he does need surgery, he has a complete year before the IBF sanctions that, you know, the next mandatory. So yep. we're looking at February of next year. I think he has time. You know, hopefully, no major surgeries. We, we might see uh, another unification at 168. Yep. And, and now let's get to the part where we. So before we get to the Caleb Plan Alvarez potential fight, right? Did we have to talk about the fight that's even before that, which mm -hmm. is well, to the second, well, the deal before that, which is basically the Saunders uh, Canelo fight, basically. So it's made official this past week. So that's we that's, talked that's, about it, but now ink dry. Exactly. So now that it's ink dry, that's where you know we're hoping to get a challenge really i mean alvarez is gonna he's got a, a mandatory at the end of this month and we, we both believe he's gonna go through that mandatory and and get through it well like i said uh Abney ain't fought in about two years his last fight he lost i mean he he's the classic example of just sitting sitting out and waiting your time to get that fight you know i, I think it's gonna get stopped like just, this is this is more for alvarez making up that money and he's staying tuned up for billy joe Saunders because this fight was supposed to happen last may if COVID didn't shut it down so He's been on Canelo's um, radar for a while, you know, so. Yeah, so I, I think I agree with you on that one. I think Canelo makes quick work of this one. I think he wants to get this, just get this mandatory out of the way. This probably fight ends probably round one, round two, and it's it's in the bank. It's, no, it's done. I, it's in Florida. I think Canelo's want to enjoy Florida a little bit there. I think it goes maybe five or six. He'll enjoy Florida anyway. So yeah, I know. He'll but, enjoy it in the yeah, ring. Yeah, I know, but he's going to get about five or six, I think. Because, you know, the first round, you know, he's he not going to let him get close to him to touch him that much. You know, about two or three. He gonna he gonna butter up that midsection like Canelo does, and then you know, at that point, then it's gonna. Be I think fight. round one he you gets, really he think gets you, you, you you're gonna go out and you really think you think it's gonna be a really quick early finish. I ain't had one of those in a while. I think probably by the third round, I think it's over. Wow. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I said second, that. but I said third round. I think it's gonna end because you know we don't talk like this for Canelo though. If Canelo's game plan is to get four fights, three four fights this year, and you're star, and you just finished fighting in December, and you've got Billy Joe Saunders. I don't care what he says. He's already looking past this fight. He's looking at Billy Joe Saunders. He's saying, I gotta, I gotta get ready for that guy. Mm -hmm. One of the best, one of the best ways and you have, you want to get ready for that fight. And then you're already targeting Caleb plant in September and stuff. You know, Caleb plants already ahead. He's not going to fight no more. Right. The only thing he's going to be prepping for is getting his hand better and training camp for you. Exactly. So if you're that guy, if you're Alvarez, you want to get this fight out of the way to prepare for Billy Joe Saunders. And, and because, there's a possibility you have to keep in mind. He might not make quick work of Billy Joe Saunders. No, that's going 12. I'm going I'm going out right now and saying Billy Joe is going 12. Yeah, yeah. Caleb, I mean, if you win 12 rounds with Caleb Smith, and with Caleb Smith barely engaging you, mm -hmm. you're going to go 12 with Billy Joe because he's probably going to engage you. So that is... Billy, that, I think Billy Joe's at his best weight at 168 because he was a big 160. He, he was 
big at 160 when I saw him fight. Um, I, I keep freaking his name from Canada. That's the middleweight that uh, Oscar was promoting for Canelo. I, I mentioned him in the last podcast. But him going to 168 now, he he's big. I'm not saying that he's going to win. He's going to give Canelo, you know, everything he can with his jab. He's a classic southpaw, and he pops that jab so hard with yep. that South Paul stance. I'm just saying that it's going to be a long 12 rounds for Canelo on that one. Just the size factor of what Billy Joe brings to the table. Yeah, I mean, so if you put, so if you think about the Caleb Smith fight, had it, had it, gone, it went 12 rounds. Not mm-hmm. much engagement from Caleb Smith, right. so I mean, Canelo couldn't knock him out. Billy, Billy Joe, Joe, his Billy, mentality is different though. He he ain't built like Smith. He's gonna he gonna fight all twelve. He's he, gonna he's built differently. If anything, he'll be steroid up for that fight because he had a steroid issue about a year and a half ago. He will come in ready, even oh. if it's illegal ready. He coming in ready. All right, tainted meat versus steroids. I can't hey, wait. Hey, I'm being honest on that one. I, hey, look it up. Billy Joe caught a case somehow though. It kind of went under the rug a little bit in the UK. That's uh, how it dope. usually goes. Is there a ghost? But I'm not making this up. This is not me just trying to be messy. No, I'm saying he will be ready, clean or unclean. He will be ready. Yeah, I think for a big payday, he'll be clean. I, I, I think the last thing you want... Hey, he's with Eddie Hearn. You never know. Remember our boy, Big Baby? Uh, yeah, never know. They, they all go to the same hey, doctor? They, they work same a, street pharmacist yeah, with those steroids? They're under the same daddy, baby. Eddie Hearn. Hey, I got those steroids for you. I got you, baby. Come on. <laughs> you want these big muscles? Uh, you want to knock out Canelo, I got more baby? for that, but I'm going to keep it PG today. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Zingo. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Zingo for having us on. Shout out to Spanglish World. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, like I guess I, I think he's going to finish this fight in February early because he he's basically, you, you gotta you got to build for the long run, and you got potentially two 24 round yeah two fights that could that could go 24 rounds altogether so yeah. um I, I mean i think by the time he gets to caleb plant he if he wins that fight against billy joe saunders he might be coming in tired in september if he's if he's if, if uh plants in december and ends up being triple g a triple g's not going down easy either so i mean you, you, the, at this at this point you have to basically plan for three fights that could go 12 rounds that that's a lot on your body. I don't care what anybody says. And if you're, you know, if you, I mean, you ain't a young kid anymore. You weren't, I mean, when the last time you fought four times in one year, that's a long time ago when you're on your way up, this is now superstar status. And you're trying to do four times in one year. That's, that's ambitious. I mean, four yeah. times in one year, five times in a, what, a year and a quarter span. That's, mm. that's a lot. Let me add to the fight that Canel's having. They're not sexy, but it's respectful, not sexy, but respectful because we complained in the 2000s how guys cherry pick. Oh, we, we bring him up here like Floyd. People mad at Floyd cherry pick, but he really didn't cherry pick. He picked the right guys at the right time, but he fought top 10 guys. If you want to say cherry pick top 10 guys. But, you know, Canelo is fighting the guys all the time. And even when a fight is off, like it's February, it's a mandatory he has to, otherwise he loses his belt. Take away that, and you look at all his fights. He's fighting everybody he can fight right now. I like the fights that he's fighting right now. I'm actually more excited about this version of Canelo than maybe the Canelo that was down by junior middleweight and, and regular middleweight. Yeah. And mainly because of this rehydrating abilities to get 10, 15 pounds more by the time the fight starts. That used to, that would drive me crazy, actually. Now so, he's, he's walking, when he gets in the ring, he's probably walking into where he's training at now. He, it, he looks comfortable now. He does look comfortable. He looks ripped and shredded. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sound like a Canelo fanboy, but we have watched him almost his whole career. And his body transformation, it makes you wonder about that. I'm not trying to be bogus. That tainted meat was working, boy. I mean, these last few fights, his midsection looks like he is working with a professional Olympic bodybuilder. Probably, but but, but I would say this. I, I, I think minus the tainted meat, he, the <laughs> fact that he wasn't able to knock out Caleb Smith, uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think basically he's at the weight class. He's peaked now. I, I, he's he's peaked for power exactly. I yeah. don't think I don't think he's going to. He he's not going to get any more power. I mean, if he if he knocks out anybody now, at super middleweight, it's because of the he not, he's basically put enough damage on the guy that he knocks him out by the late rounds. He's at Floyd at welterweight because I like to use this analogy when people argue with me in the barbershop back in the day that Floyd didn't have any power. His first twenty six fights, he had like twenty two knockouts. Yep. I mean, he may not have the one hitter quitter power, but not everybody has one hitter quitter. But if you're strong enough to accumulate punches and get guys out in four or five rounds, you have power. So at 130, 135, Floyd was taking everybody out. That was his peak power yeah, at that yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. But when he got to 147, that was his fifth weight class. Yep. You, something's got to go when you keep going up weight classes. Either your speed or your power is going to go. In this case, his power left, but he stayed with his speed. And so basically, he transformed who he was. He definitely ended up being a lot more defensive, way more defensive, but it, 
it works. Right. It works. I mean, if you're accurate, you can be defensive all you want. As long as by the end of the round, I hit you five times, you hit me nothing. Mm -hmm. And then with Canelo right now, I say, like, this is his fourth, technically his fifth weight class. He started at welterweight. He didn't stay there long. But he's he's been champion at four divisions now. But his professional career, he's at his fifth division. Yep. So technically, we're seeing how smaller fighters or smaller, not small, but smaller fighters who go up in the rankings, I mean, go up into the divisions. Either one of those two things want to go, and sometimes both goes, and maybe you use your skill and your caginess to get through fights. Because you sometimes when you get older, you're gonna lose a little bit off your fastball. Yep. You know, I mean, like I said, you go up in weight and you're fighting against guys who normally walk around at 220 pounds coming down to one, you know, to 175, or guys walk around at 200 pounds coming down to 168. It doesn't sound that is actually real. Mm -hmm. 190 coming down to 168. Canelo's probably walk around at 175 now, 180, and don't gotta do much. Like when Floyd now, when he likes he got to 147. He was walking around like 155, 156. Yep. That's why he was at his peak and beating guys. If you don't got to drain your weight, you're not draining any power. You're walking into the ring how you pre pre prepare for that day. Yep. If you got to drop 20 pounds overnight, how do you think you're going to feel at 70% of yourself with 20 pounds gone and then trying to fight at 10 o'clock at night against a guy trying to knock your head off? Yeah, that's one exercise he doesn't have to do. He doesn't have to train and stuff. So I, I mm -hmm. mean, he doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to train to drain weight. You can focus on his craft and he's focused on uh, studying the other fighter and stuff, doing his film study. Great boxing IQ. I, yeah. I just, uh, but he's definitely, I think, at his peak power. So I don't see him knocking anybody out now. No. I, and, you, and you can kind of see that. Unless like I said. the guy's over the hill, like Kovalev. Yeah. Like when you get to that point where Kovalev had them battles and those wars, you do enough pepper into the body. It wasn't the fact that he got the one hitter quitter. He just, he was just ready to go. Yeah. Guys like that, you know, you, you, you warm them up and then you take them down. That's the only fights that I could see him getting knockouts if he fights any older guys and he warms them down and then it's a wrap. But guys like Caleb Smith, Guys like uh, Billy Joe Saunders. I think even may if Caleb Plant's healthy, you know, I don't see him stopping Triple G right now. Even though may maybe another year or two when Triple G got a little bit more grace, possibly, I don't see him stopping any of the Charlo brothers. Yep. You know, so it gets to a point where a fighter hits that peak, but his boxing skills are magnificent. He uses his jab. He uses his his footwork. He he knows how to walk guys down. I mean, the body game is impeccable. You know, he uses everything to to take care of that. And sometimes the knockout comes because accumulation of damage yep. you know but i agree with you though i all these fights coming up these are 12 rounders except for i can see in february how that could be a short fight yeah. but everybody who we mentioned the the may fight if, if it plants in september if there's a triple g3 if it's jamal chalo one any of these guys i think it's going 12 probably yeah. no I'm, I'm with you on that and, and i think he needs to probably get a knockout in this fight because he needs to still kind of advertise that he has that kind of power still Every once in a while, yeah. yeah. I guess and he's in his what? This is a 60th plus fight right now. Yeah, yeah. It, it does help for. I mean, he's a guy, but it does help for advertising. And then you put it on Sports Center, on ESPN. When the top guy goes, like you watch at eleven o'clock midnight on Sunday, Sports Center, that he get a knockout. You're ready for a single mile, the big event in Vegas. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll be there. It's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a great selling point. He needs. I, I I expect him to go for that knockout. Now, I will say this though: if for whatever reason that fight goes twelve rounds against a mandatory. We're gonna have a lot to talk about because that would be something I would not expect. It depends on how the twelve rounds go. Though. Exactly, I want to see how this fight. Like, the, is, it, is it like a plant situation where he hurts his hand and only has one hand and it goes to twelve, or does Avni step up to the game? He's in Miami, has some good Cuban food before everything stuff you know gets on, and he has the fight of his life like Rocky. No, 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 he had a game oh. of dominoes down by, by Miami. <laughs> there, he played some dominoes like I would do if I was in Miami, and uh, yeah, I'd be ready for a fight. I, I love the Cuban food. It's been a while, but let me let me stop before I get started on some food right now. Start salivating on that mic and shit. Mm. Good food, oh, needy. <laughs> let me stop. <laughs> we'll keep it PG, folks. Yeah, we keep it PG here. Let's move on to the next point here. I'm gonna hit it again. Uh, update: We talked about Floyd Mayweather against Logan Paul. Not happening. Yep, canceled for COVID reasons, and I believe there was one more. Well, here's the thing, though. Since the I, I'm gonna give you some details. I didn't tell you before we was talking. Of course, about you're holding back from. I me. got to hold. Back. Always hold that. We got pre meeting for a reason. Yeah, you know what though? I like to hold back because Jorge's reaction sometimes is priceless. All right, all right. Let me have it. So, uh, I I don't I don't believe this is true, but Logan's Paul camp said that something happened last week where something got leaked regarding the fight from his camp. Some new guy was brought in, like a training part or something like that, and okay. leaked some stuff out. And then they heard from Floyd's camp, and they were pissed off. And then there was like a couple of days where the L's radio silence and they said they tried to reach out to Floyd and nothing happened. Then all of a sudden, then by the weekend, they leaked it that it was a possible postponement, but not they, you know, you know how someone says, 
you know, to call a reporter up. It ain't officially off yet, but here you go. I'm giving you this lead right now. And then it finally came out that it was leaked, and then it's all it's out now. I'm putting two and two together. Broner's fight had gets had um got moved to the 20th. Mm-hmm. Broner is still a money man for Al Heyman and Showtime PBC. Not a good look that he's competing against Floyd on a on the same night on different cards. Yep. Floyd would be on pay per view, of course, and Broner would have been on um Showtime Premium. So. This is the fight that would have made a lot of money for Floyd, but it's not going anywhere. Floyd could have this fight in February. He could have it in April. He could have it anytime he wants. He can have it anytime he wants. This is me. It's not a conspiracy theorist. This is just me analyzing. I should say conspiracy, but people look at, say, it's conspiracy all the time and don't, you know, but this is me looking at the lens of boxing. Analyzing conspiracy. Analyzing. Al Hammond looked at the fact that Broner is still a money guy. Even though he's broke right now, he generates ratings. I'm in bed with uh, Steven Espinosa at Showtime. We got to keep Broner alive here. We got to keep this train going here until he can't do it no more. Yep. He may lose to Manny Pacquiao, but he's going to beat, uh, uh, you know, some other guy at 140 or mm-hmm. 147. You know, guys, we need to, you know, you need to get him, get him tuned up. You know, if he's looking good, he can beat. He has a chance to beat guys at 140 and 147 if he wants to. That's the thing of Adrian Broner. But Heyman doesn't need that meal ticket still. He has a whole fleet of fighters but not as many generate ratings like Adrian Broner. Yeah. No matter how we look at him, he still puts eyes on TV. And if it wasn't for COVID, he still puts butts in the seats. He's still he's still the heel. He yes. still he still has the the heel rub, uh, rep that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and he might be kind of like what we were talking about with Caleb Clinton and Truex, right? He's not exactly Truex, but he's exactly the type of fighter that can if he wanted to give a crap about a championship fight, right? Say against a guy he shouldn't, you know, that. Maybe don't people don't have him as the favorite for, but if he really wanted to give a crap about that fight, whoever that fighter is, he'll put on his best performance that day because he knows that might be his last chance at a contractual title. Broner to me, right now, is the common day version of uh, Macho Man. Oh, Holy Hector Camacho. Hector Camacho. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Dennis. I mean, but Camacho's a Hall of Famer though. Let's just get let's get kid it twisted. Yeah. Take away the end of his career and how sad it ended. You know, and the things that he, the demons he battled in his prime, badass. Yeah, he was entertaining. Cold, entertaining. Bruno was entertaining, but he's not a Hall of Famer. No. In his peak, Macho was bad. Yeah, I, we were talking I, Hall of Fame well before his career was yeah, ending. Yeah, I, I used to love, as a shorty, getting up for his fights, watching him, because he was just entertaining. He was one of the first guys you see. He had the tassel. Like, when you look at those shorts, you're like... You know, I'm not trying to say that like when you're in the eighties, you looked at the short, you thought he was gay. <laughs> I am not lying. I'm going to say this out here because he was flamboyant. He was flamboyant. And I'm going to say that in the boxing culture, when you wear the things that he would wear, this was, was at the there. time, this was at the and, time. And too. I'm speaking eighties mentality. Yeah. I didn't think that, but other people thought that. And it's like, you think it's like, yeah, he can't be, he's a boxer, but it don't matter. Nowadays, a, a you know, a gay fighter, straight fighter, whoop your ass any day. It don't mm-hmm. matter, you know, but he brought some to the table where that, I was this young kid and I was drawn. I couldn't even, you know, here's this Puerto Rican flashy fighter. I'm like, yo, even when he fought Chavez and I knew Chavez was going to whip him, I was still rooting for him because he just brought something that I loved, you know, and that's Broner. You may not like him. He brings him to the table that everybody wants to see. It's just, he still got time to do something about it. I don't know, Kenny, but one thing I will say though, he looks in great shape right now. This is the first time I've seen him in shape like this in a long time. Like he, he's putting in the work for this fight because he knows he loses this fight. It's a wrap. He is truly true ex- journeyman status, but could still draw fans. He may get 500,000 to fight, but he'll be true journeyman status and no title shots until he starts winning a few. So he he's looking good because he knows he needs his win for another big fight. Yeah, no, I, I mean, he'll need him. He'll need this fight. He'll need probably a couple more fights where it looks like he's in great shape and he's taking the fight seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there'll, there'll be a fight there. I think if he does the right things, there'll be a fight there, and he'll be and there'll be a reason to watch him. I think a lot of the people that are still watching still look at him as the heel. Yeah, as long as he comes in ready to fight and performing well at those fights, and he wins those fights, he can still carry that heel rep around, but still kind of like take his life seriously a little bit, take his career seriously. And as a boxing fan, you can. If you're a true boxing fan, not a casual fan, but a, a boxing fan who's probably followed his career, you'll be able to see through the facade of what the heel rep is. And you'll know that he's trying to do something serious with his life at the later parts of his life. And that's what you're hoping for. Mm-hmm. You know, I definitely, I mean, Broner, for what he was at the time, 
I would talk about him in the same way I would talk about Ryan Garcia. No different. I actually didn't, I, when Maidana knocked him out, that was great because I felt he needed to get humbled. He didn't get humbled enough, apparently, because he ended up getting, I mean, losing a few more fights after that. But I, at this point, he's still. When you're you know, a four-division champion, it's kind of hard. At his age and the money he was making, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to humble somebody when you ain't ready to be humbled, man. And, you, and even now. He's still getting paid a lot of money for his stature. No, no, and he's getting and he's getting paid for the right reasons. Again, he, you know, he's he's still a personality in boxing yeah, and course. stuff. So, that so, sells so, fights, and and that, and that sold fights then when you know before he lost to Madonna, and and then afterwards he was still the heel, you know. But I, I think he's also playing the heel up more as the rep that he was before. If he's if he's truly trying to take care of his career and, and try to get another shot at a title, he'll he'll, he'll put in that work time. He'll put in that work on the twentieth, and he'll put in that work again the rest of this year. And we might see him in the title fight soon. Yeah, so I'm not. I don't want to go in too much about it because I don't even know who his opponent is yet. Because the original opponent, the fight was supposed to be this weekend. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It, it got shifted. It got postponed because someone hit, the fighter didn't test positive for COVID, but someone in his camp did. So there, I know they had mentioned a few names, but it wasn't concrete. So I'm not going to name the names until they're concrete right now. So he doesn't have a fighter yet. So we will do a breakdown once we have all the details who's actually going to be in the ring with him, where the fight's going to be at. It's going to happen in about three weeks. So we'll do a, like we did here with Caleb Plant, we'll do a fight preview and a fight in a post fight as well. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. And let, let's be honest too, though, with this, I want Adrian Broner to win as much as he's an ass, as much as he's a heel and does so much dumb stuff. <laughs> it makes like an oxymoron. Boxing kind of needs him. Uh, I don't say boxing. No, 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 no not, 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 I say need. Need is a is a strong word. Want it's a hard want. You know you don't want you don't want that personality out the game just yet. You want to see him perform and still put busting seats and give those nice sound bites after the fight that he's the can man and anybody can get it. Well, the, okay, so here okay, I'm in the opposite. I, I I don't I want the boxer. I don't want the personality. I want the personality. To, I at this point in his career, I I don't need the personality. The rep the rep can still, can still carry the fight. Well, carry the the buildup of the fight. You're different to me. I want the personality because I need him still. So I don't want him quiet. Still, keep talking. I, I, keep talking. At, at the end of the, at this at this point in his career and stuff, if he can give me six to ten good fights to wrap up his entire career, and along the way picks up a title, that and and with less of the personality, as I understand, Adrian Broner is talented. Oh, I, I always find I always find I always let's, find let's put say that again. He's talented. He's a talented he is, fighter. He, he, if he, he wants to be, he is damn good. But but the problem is, I think he allows that personality to be carried into the ring. So like, in other words, you can have the personality, but leave that shit outside the ring. Once you get in the ring, don't bring that. Don't bring the ego with it. And he brought the ego with it. And when he got humbled, he got humbled. And he mm -hmm. and honestly, it's to the point where he hasn't recovered from that. So if he gets to a point where he understands. Stop bringing that ego into the ring and bring what you know best, which is your boxing IQ and your hand speed and your power. You're going to, you know, I mean, you're not going to have much power at 147, but bring me everything else that you brought with in the past that I enjoyed watching you did. You had a great boxing IQ. I, I enjoyed watching it. I just don't need the personality in the ring with you. Mm -hmm. Speaking of guys who don't have as many personalities, that's coming up here that just got scheduled. At 140, Trent, changing gears here. We're going to have our second unification, complete, undisputed 140 championship here between Josh Taylor and Jose Ramirez. That fight was put on for May 8th, and we're looking at Taylor at 17-0-13 knockouts and Ramirez at 26-0-17 knockouts. So Bob Arum has an own on 140. It, I just wish that 140 was a little bit – it's hot, like the guys that he's building up. But they just don't have the personalities. It's just, it's just not there. Like if this was at 147, this would be like, woo. If this was at 160, woo. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, we're, we're talking about like last week, Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury, woo, undisputed. We're talking about 140, yeah. But it, it, here's the thing, though. It's not special, like, glitz and glamour like that when you see the roses. But when we watch this fight on May 8th, it's going to be a damn good fight. It's going to be a good fight. And it's it's funny when we talk about, like, and this is kind of goes, like, in the, this is all cyclical with boxing and stuff like that, right? So certain promotional kind of, Camps will have different uh, stables at different weight classes, right? So we talk about Bob Aram's weight class, the top rank for welterweight. Mm -hmm. Outside of Terrence Crawford, very dry, nothing. Yeah, but this is there's a reason why it's dry because that junior welterweight, that's where all his four his his 
up and coming welterweights are all going to be there. So uh, this, so this, this fight's a big deal because whatever the outcome of this fight is, it doesn't matter because they potentially can go with each other, go against each other again at welterweight. Yes. And and by welterweight, now you're looking at hopefully by that point a different stable of welterweights where there's maybe. Right now, we're talking about these two that are coming up at junior welterweight. There might be others that are behind there that are also going to be coming up as well. So it's going to make for an interesting welterweight division five years down the road, I would say. Right, Once this fight happens and before these guys decide to move up to welterweight. So say give it about five years where these guys are probably the, the main guys at welterweight at that point. By that point, I think Crawford and Spence are all moving up into junior middleweights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to have a new crop of welterweights coming up real soon. And it starts with these junior welterweights that are fighting for unica uh, unification belt on May 8th. I'm looking at this as, depending on the timing on Crawford's uh, time scale, a lot of drama, a lot of messiness, social media going on with Crawford right sure. now. And these two guys here look like to be in line for Crawford if this fight can happen close to the end of the year. The issue is, Crawford's contract got publicly put out there. It's going to end it in October. So time is not on Bob Aram's hands right now because he's been publicly seeing some things that a promoter normally doesn't say about a fighter. And so at this point right now, I guess you can agree with me too, that Crawford's done a top ranked. He's, yeah. he's he Aram took care of him, paid him handsomely. Nice for the competition. He's got the problem though, is that he ain't getting the fights that he needs. Yeah, and that's, and, and, that's a, and it's not happening no time soon either. And that's why this fight comes into play. I'm sorry to sure. cut you off. All right, go ahead, go ahead. You know, I'm gonna let you get to that point. So whoever wins this fight, once again, undisputed, just like Terrence Crawford. And like we know right away, when this happens within the week, them belts, one of those two belts are getting stripped right away because the sanctioning body, someone didn't do a mandatory so this fight can happen. So the winner is not staying. You win, you get your photo op, you're the second undisputed champion at 140, and you're going right to 147. So it looks like this guy, whoever Taylor Ramirez is being set up for Crawford at the end of the year, possibly, if he's still working with Bob Arum to get that contract done. Yeah. I was looking at, too, I mentioned to you that there's a possibility that he may find uh, fight Virgil Ortiz Jr. A lot of stuff that was happening this week is with Bob Arum and Golden Boy, Oscar and Eric Gomez talked this past week, and um, we're going to, I mentioned, we mentioned this on another segment that's not going to be on this one that we'll be uh, putting on out later on this week about uh, that, but it's looking like that Crawford could possibly have two more fights with top rank this year with Ortiz, of course, uh, enter, you know, golden boy. And then the winner of this one here, and then he's free sailing to do what he want to do. Because after between, after between these two fights, possibly who does Aram have for Crawford at welterweight? Nobody. Yeah. He's been trying so hard. He got, he has nobody signed at welterweight. Like Heyman has that. Heyman's had that locked down. And before Heyman PBC, it was golden boy. Like I said, the, the fact of how golden boy changed when Oscar's situation. Yeah. They always own welterweight. That's why Floyd was working with Golden Boy. All those welterweight fights, fighters with him, so he had his one off there. If for whatever reason it is, Aaron can get one good welterweight. He can't get two or three or four. <laughs> he had Tim Bradley with Manny Pacquiao, and he milked that out, you know. But it's looking like that Terrence Crawford's run in 2021 with, with top rank could be over with these two fights, and then we'll see what happens from there. But how do you view these poppy two fights? I think those fights will be interesting fights uh, for Crawford. I think Crawford. Uh, he should win those fights. Should, Craw 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 yeah. Crawford is a very dynamic fight. I've talked about him in the past shows before. Uh, I'm high on Crawford. It's I think the timing of his contract with top rank sucked because basically the, you know, usually within your promotional company, you try to find the best fights there first before you go out because those are usually easier to make. In this case, because there's nobody else there, you know, it sucks for Crawford, right? I don't, not sorry, I don't think it's timing. It's just Aram. He's never had many welterweights. Look at Manny's career from 29, 2009 when he went to welterweight after he beat Oscar up into the Floyd fight. What was the problem? He had no welterweights. The issue was he was recycling fights that Floyd had first. Because once Floyd beat you, then though they were not under contract. And, and then he got him. Like, for instance, we, we can go down Manny's schedule from 2010 to 2015 before he fought Floyd. Mm -hmm. Take away the Marquez three fights and the Bradley fights. He was recycling everybody. If there was no welterweights for him, Bob Aram doesn't have any. He never has welterweight one or two, but he'll have a top guy. Well, that's, well, that's been going on for like almost fifteen years now. Well, if you think about it, it it's not okay. So think about it even further. I think the, the analysis is dead on, except for the part where you're talking about junior welterweights, because at the time of junior welterweight, you had five or six different junior welterweights that were just starting to come up. Are you talking about the Quintanas? You're talking about Cotto? 
there was they were the, not superstars. The, 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 no, no, they were they were just up and coming though. They were up. A, look, I started to cut you off. I hate I hate to do that. I know what you mentioned that 140, but I'm saying like once they go to 147, Aram didn't have these guys. Aram still had. It, it was it was mainly Golden Boy. You had a few guys with main events, and then that was it. Like Aram had two or three. He had Manny, and then he he pulled Tim Bradley away, and Tim Bradley was with uh, Duva. Yeah. After that, he had he had Khan and Khan jump shift because that was been a big fight. Mm. I'm saying that if you look at Bob Aram's record at welterweight. He may have a few guys that were good contenders. He never had the guys that say like like, like Crawford right now. These last three years, he can just he does not have the stable that says I can sell this fight. And people don't think that Crawford is not somebody who's established at welterweight yet. We believe Spence at welterweight. Like you said, we have people who have question marks about Crawford at 147. Aram stable, he can build up any state for some reason at 147. We have a good 15 years of data that shows. He does not get that statement. He has two or three. He have a few guys that put him in as a mandatory, like I said, at 140. But at 147, PBC owns it. He has – and, and, and so, again, remember, maybe going back to the history. Yeah, go ahead. Junior welterweight, right, and up to welterweight. He had, he had more than that, right? Because I believe – so he comes up to your junior welterweight going into welterweight. I think at that point he already had Margarito. He already had Kermit Cintron. He had Colazzo, I believe. Then you had Cotto coming up. The Colombian fight, I forget his name, that he fought. Cotto almost lost a fight in junior welterweight to one of the champions there. And basically, and, and then I'm knocking him out and, and win miraculously the fight. But And this was like when it was draining weight at the time. I forget that fighter's name, but he was one of those guys that was also up and coming to 147. And I think he just finished out his career at 140 and he was done. But there were fights there. There were definitely fights there. Now, the problem with Merrim is maybe keeping him at 147 long term after that contract wise right and i think if you think about it at that at that time mayweather was already starting to have the divorce then golden boy was in the picture at 147 right so that's where you kind of had uh fighters making 147 making it to 147 and then it also had a mixture of fighters that were at different camps that went either at luduvas or uh, with hearn or whoever where they were at. they were they were more they were they were stables but not full stables right where you going maybe you had three or four welterweights in your camp Golden Boy had about three or four in their camp, and then Duvas had about maybe two or three. So they were kind of, you know, spread around in a couple different areas, right? I like. To, I sorry to cut you off. Of course, you're gonna cut me off. Yes, but. the issue is those guys maybe been there before 147, or they were signed elsewhere. But up until 140, like you said, the core of Bob Aram was Cotto and Pacquiao. We can look. We can look the rosters up. He does. He went once at 147. We can look at every year and who was signed there. Marquez, then Cotto left. When Cotto was there, then Cotto left. You know, he bounced back and forth. But Cotto bounced back and forth. Well, well, Cotto's at welterweight by the time Pacquiao even gets to work. Remember, Pacquiao campaigned at 140 for a couple of fights. He fought. Uh, Apparently, he jumped. He went to 140, beat the crap out of Ricky Haddon. Two, Ricky and two, Haddon. And, and, then, then he, and then went straight to the De La Hoya fight. And then he fought uh, David Diaz. That was the other fight that he and, fought. Uh, but, the Chicago but, guy. But then once he got to uh, welter, he stayed at welter. He may have had it at one. He may have weighed at 143. The point I'm saying, though, is that if you look at Aram Stable, he had Cotto, he had Pacquiao, he poached away Bradley, and we know that, that was those two fights were not even good for Pacquiao. If you look at the roster, once Pacquiao got the 147, he only had Cotto as fights. And you look at Golden Boys fights, they were all spectacular. Even the regular ones that were regular HBO, they were events. Mm -hmm. And then the pay-per-views were events. Aram, I didn't buy him. He didn't have anybody. And that's been the thing. He does not. He he will have him at 140, like we're seeing right now. But he'll lose when he gets to 147. Or, or if they do, they do not muster anything at 147. And, and they're I, not. They're not names. And the difference is that when you get to 147 with PBC slash Golden Boy in the past, not only were they established, they were names. They kept winning. Well, the thing is, once you get so so now that we're talking about history here with Golden mm -hmm. Boy and then PBC basically taking those fighters underneath from Golden Boy, a lot of those fights. Sucked at 147. The fighters got paid, but they weren't fighting nowhere near as often. Danny Garcia was a hungry, hungry fighter well before PBC got his hands on him. And once they got their hands on him, he was never the same. To me, he never was the same. No, no. He was different once he knocked out Amir Khan. He fought. Um, and that's, still, that's still technically Golden Boy. They're the, still the same. But he once he got his hands on Amir Khan and knocked him out and his name was on the map. And then once he got. Uh, and then once he knocked out. um, Not knocked out. He knocked down. Um, 
What's his name? Lucas Matisse? Matisse, that was that was the, the main fight. That, that was, was the main the fight. fight. And I was there with my pops. We went to see the Canelo uh Mayweather fight, and I was on the undercard. But after that fight, that was different then because you couldn't tell De- Garcia nothing. Yeah, no, no. He, I, he I, was I, established, he was the man at 140, and that was it. Exactly. So then when he fought to me, he fought an Amir Khan. Whatever we can say about Amir Khan and the, mm-hmm. t- the talent he had. The other day, Aram had him and he lost him. That's another welterweight. That, I, that and I, I, and at the end of the day, I think that was probably his worst contract that he signed. Because honestly, I wouldn't have signed your con for any of that stuff. Last draw and everything. I wouldn't. I he would have not. made more money off that than those Bradley fights. Uh, I still wouldn't have yes, signed. Not, yes, not yes, Amir Khan. Not, uh, yes, it would. Because you know what Amir Khan has? He has that. You he brings the UK money. He has Bradley a, has Bradley brings no money. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a fact. If you look at the pay per view numbers for Amir Khan in the UK and the Muslim community huge that's why he stayed that's why he's been fighting as long as he has and had the name that he does because you may not see it in the states but when you go to uk and then the muslim community in the arab world khan generates money khan Khan generated money but i mean for a boxing and she needed to generate that money as well in the states and he was not generating in the states but the thing is that if you have secondary income that matches the state's money which the other fighters don't like tim bradley love him great commentator you know he's gotten Mm -hmm. better but he did not bring no money not overseas not even in the states not even in his own home state that he brought money in so you see what i'm saying like even though you may not bring money in america if you generate revenue that's normally not coming from these other fighters that makes you viable because you can sell those fights to other regions and you sell that like for instance like who's gonna buy the rights in canada who buys the rights in the uk sure who buys those rights that is seven figure rights deals that's what Khan brings. That's why he's hung around as long as he has and getting these fights like when he fought canelo and got blasted in that fifth round canelo of course was gonna do it because hey i'm fighting a welterweight but he looked at it too Oh man, this is UK money. This is the money. I'm Mexican and I bring a lot of money, but this is money that they don't rock with me with. Sure. So that's the point I'm saying though with that is that Aram had him. Aram should have kept him because he would have got UK cut. You're not getting the UK cut against uh with Mar- Marquez. You're getting Mexican money. Mexico. They the Latinos support him. Great, I- but not as much as Canelo, though. He's not that superstar. So the point I'm saying that he could have kept him, he didn't. No, but the thing with Mir Khan though is he was chasing Floyd at the time. That's another story that we could probably come down, come to end the show here. But the reason why he lost him because of Floyd and he was following Floyd and that fight almost happened. So let's get back off the tangent. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Back <laughs> because, 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 because yeah. you can go, because I we think from the, because, because in the business aspect, you can go on forever yes, about this. I still think that's a stable of fighters. That's Aram's just prepping up junior Welcher way to bring him up. That's that's that. I think that, that I, the, the, I agree. He used it to prep it up, but the execution in Welcher weight never materialized and he never had anybody at Welcher weight the last 10 to 15 years. I'm hoping years, his son does it people. and I'm hoping his son takes a different approach. I'm again, well, junior Welcher weight, he's done it twice. He's brought him up to he's done at least two times that I can see right now where he's actually brought up junior Welcher weight to Welcher weight. Mm-hmm. Whether he keeps him at Welcher weight, that's a different discussion that yeah, we can yeah. continue having for like another hour on a different show. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I th- so I'm hoping his son takes a different approach I and finds some way to keep him around. I think, you know, Aaron just turned 89. So, you know, depending on how many summers he got left in him, we'll see. Mm-hmm. You know, dude's had a long life and he's still going hard in the promoting game. Yeah. Todd DeBow is different. That's one thing about Todd DeBow is like, even Floyd was glowingly talking good about Todd. Like when they couldn't do the deals with the Manny Pacquiao in the years, Floyd per- said, I never forget this, if Todd was the only one doing the negotiating and Bob was involved, we would have that Manny fight done years ago. Probably. He, Todd is that one guy in the middle who was like, he works with everybody. Everybody likes him. Bob Aram's the bad cop. You know, he he drives people away. And over the years, by him being extended to and being the number two guy, he's going to run it, you know, when whenever Bob is stepping away or passes away. Mm. I think you're going to see a lot more top rank infusion. Of course, it'll be politics because, you know, you got to maintain the in-house to keep all the money. I just think that I see that happening more because the fact that you're seeing um, Oscar, you now they've had their issues, but they're like I said, they were talking this week. They were together talking to Fimo Lopez. You know, they're talking Ryan Garcia. We'll, we'll talk about you'll see in a future episode, you know, and we're seeing this here like with Todd. But I just think that, like you said, though, whenever that happens, I think the floodgates will open with, with uh, top rank. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I firmly believe that. I mean, I think, again, top rank hasn't been in the game this long without doing the right things and also taking some pitfalls along the way. And I and look, everybody goes through business doing those things. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, to me, they've been around long enough to know that, hey, they make some mistakes and they make the, the adjust. And, again, Bob Aram, love him or hate him, he knows how to build up the fighters. He knows how to lose the contracts, but he also knows at times, you know, when to keep the right fighters around. So I'll give him that. 
on that note, we got to close out shop here, man. We can do this for another hour if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah. As soon as we start talking to business, I'm like, oh, no, here yeah, goes Dave. This is like another uh, hour. Oh, uh, all right. Let's have it. Let's yeah, have it. Yeah. So on that note, man, we're going to close it out here. We want to thank everybody if you were checking us out here. So like, I'm going to say it again. Click on like and subscribe. Click the notification bell down below here so that you get new episodes. We ain't got to tell you about it. It just pops right up. Also, like I said, YouTube. Like I said, Box Now Podcast, Spotify, follow. If you're on the Zingo app, click on that heart for channel 250. And also, too, uh, Wednesdays for me, live, Wednesday at 8 p.m. on uh, on uh, YouTube, jump off live. What you got here, Jorge? Sure, live underscore dominoes. That's the TV, that's the Twitch TV channel. Uh, we play on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 8 p.m. to about 11 o'clock. Uh, looking for a possible schedule change in the future, so we'll definitely keep everybody posted with there. So live underscore dominoes, Twitch TV uh tuesdays thursdays and saturdays okay and on that note we're gonna end this show here gonna give a teaser here because we might drop a drop a bonus episode this week so we talked about some things in this episode and there might be some carryover so i'm just gonna tease that with you but for this episode here i have my main man jorge i'm that dude named dave and for boxing out podcast we're out of here yep see you folks Dancing.